Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teach to Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am delighted to be joined by Elizabeth Leiber. Elizabeth, Elizabeth is the EdTap Experience uh, podcast host and also LinkedIn's top voices of 2020. Good afternoon, uh, Elizabeth, how are you? I'm doing awesome, Ross. Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. Thank you. It's, uh, I mean, obviously, we've connected through LinkedIn uh, and your recent uh, award uh, as a top voice. How do you feel? I'm excited. How do you feel? I feel awesome. <laughs> no, I, I, well, it's, you know, I, I, I've got a mixed relationship with LinkedIn, actually. How about yourself? Uh, it, it's weird. I never really was active on LinkedIn until this year. It was like I had my resume there. I've been at my job for six years, so I wasn't job hunting. So I never went on LinkedIn. And then this year with the lockdown and with being um, a little bit kind of feeling like displaced, I started to go on there more and more and try to connect with people and kind of get a little bit more of that social aspect of it. And it's been good in that respect, being able to connect with people like yourself yeah, that absolutely. are doing Fantastic. big things. It's, yeah, it's, for sure. it's great to get that recognition, I suppose. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that you're passionate about, you know, uh, obviously teaching, technology, diversity. So I'll talk about those things shortly. Um, just for context for people listening here in the UK, and I do have uh, one or two people over in the States who do listen in. Um, could you just give everyone a little bit of a background into your educational uh, experiences? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm. Um, I was. I was raised in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I actually have lived here since I was twelve. I'm actually from the UK, so I was born in London, in Southeast London. My family is uh, from the Caribbean. They're they're Jamaican, and they actually went to UK when they were teenagers. Met, fell in love, and had me and my brothers, and decided to move to Florida when they were like, mm, like I, I was twelve, so they were probably like in their thirties, yeah. like early forties, and then. They just felt as though they just wanted to do something different. My grandmother was living here and we came here. We we were all raised here. So I went to University of Florida. I went there on a full journalism scholarship. I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And after being there, I just kind of figured, you know what, I want to go into education. I just decided I wanted to try something else. So started working in actually K through 12 and then uh, did some time working for a nonprofit. So I've actually worked for the Salvation Army. That was one of my first jobs. And I know that you're yeah. passionate and they have experience with <laughs> Salvation Army. So I was a volunteer coordinator. I coordinated the Angel Chief program. I did that. And from there, I went into higher education working as, I was like, well, volunteers, I recruited volunteers. Maybe I can recruit students. Wow. So I started working in admissions and I worked in admissions for almost a decade. And then I switched over to faculty and I've been a faculty member, both full-time and part-time for the past decade. I've also worked as an instructional designer, which means that for the past six years or so for my school that I work for currently, still teach part-time mm -hmm. as an adjunct um, instructor for a variety of online programs, community colleges, state schools, um, private schools. I've worked for pretty much all of them, like a dozen uh, or, or so. so. You're, very, you're, you're very busy. Very busy, but you know, I love to stay busy. I love to try different things. I think as a, it, because I design online classes, I like to keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the classroom, mm -hmm. which is why I always still kind of teach a class here and there. And I've been designing online classes for like the past six years, which is coming in handy right now because yeah, everybody's yeah, pivoted to online. I was, I was just going to talk, you know, the life of a teacher is endlessly busy, you know, not enough cash, all those types of things. So if we kind of uh, steer our focus towards the COVID pandemic, Elizabeth, and you know, I've been really interested in the academic research uh, of remote learning throughout the last six months. Um, just give our listeners an insight into the pressures that you faced in your own educational setting during the pandemic, how you've adjusted, uh, and any insights you might have. Yeah, that's interesting. I think for me, it was not as much of an adjustment because I have already been teaching online for quite a, I taught, I started teaching online before I taught in the classroom. So I started teaching online. My first job teaching online was in 2008. I taught for Grand Canyon University, which is a huge online school. And um, I've taught for a lot of big online programs like Strayer University and Ultimate Medical Academy. Some of those students, some of those schools have like 40,000 students, 50,000 mm -hmm. students. So I'm used to like that course load and 
having to navigate online platforms, which I've done, um, you know, pretty much consistently over the past 10 years. So it wasn't as big of an adjustment. I think for students, it's definitely different because a lot of students have never taken online. A lot of instructors have never taught online. Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of instructors, it has been a big adjustment because they don't understand like, well, how does it work? Do you have to do live classes? Do you do Zoom? Like a lot of people don't really understand that. What do you think has been the pain barrier? You know, I've been doing webinars for 10 years myself, so it's been pretty easy to switch. Um, what's been the biggest pain barrier you've observed in your colleagues who may not have got that online experience? I think a lot of it is not really understanding the pedagogy. Like a lot of people feel like in order for something to be, um, in order for it to be beneficial or in order for it to be effective or engaging, it has to be like what we're doing. Like we've engaged with each other because we've been messaging, I've seen your posting and, and I, I've kind of seen what you're doing. I looked at your website. So I don't have to engage with you live in order to engage with you, you know what I mean? But sure. I think people have this understanding that in order for me to learn, like I can learn from you because I can go on your website and I can, re- I can listen to your podcast and I can message you and ask you questions about concepts. I don't have to do that in a live setting and it's good to do it in a live setting, but I wouldn't want to do this eight hours straight. And yeah. I think sometimes, Instructors feel as though the only way to get engagement with students is it has to be in this live synchronous environment, which is what they're used to in the classroom. Uh And the thing that we've all seen is that people get Zoom fatigue. People don't necessarily, being on cam, I'm aware of myself. I'm looking at the background. I want to make sure the kids are not going to make any noise. Is someone opening the door? I'm up constantly. I have so many different... um, Well, we do that in the classroom too, don't we? And we do. We do that in the classroom, but I think we're not as aware of it. And I think there's something to be said about the idea that synchronous and asynchronous when we're talking about online teaching pedagogy most of the big schools that are have been doing online well for the past since the 80s a lot of them have don't even have a synchronous component so i think synchronous is kind of the icing on the cake you don't have to have synchronous you definitely can have asynchronous and i think for a lot of the 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 it's just like sage on the stage there was a time where has there been a bit of a, you know, our politicians here in the UK, or at least in England, have been really trying to push our state schools to do more synchronous lessons, which is, you know, the challenge for, you know, teachers working with vulnerable kids is that safeguarding issue, you know, what what, 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 what might happen at home, online, behind the camera, uh, are there, is there someone there to support a, a five-year-old or a vulnerable 16-year-old, and um, is that, is there a much pressure on teachers over in the US to do that type of stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, uh, I think for the K through 12, there's the concept of trying to replicate what happens in the classroom because of the fact that students are not as self-directed. So they want to give that, mm-hmm. that, it, that one-on-one interactive, making sure the students have that support. And, and there definitely is a lot of, of confusion about how to do that. And I think my, my daughter, she did high school online and I, I think it just goes back again to pedagogy. There is a conflict between what is good online and how does online function. And my daughter did K through, I mean, she she was in K through 12, she did high school online and never had synchronous was not required and she did great. So I think it's, it's, a lot of it is not understanding what online pedagogy really consists of. And a lot of people are very adamant that it has to consist of, synchronous it has to have web it has to it's just like sage on the stage a lot of us have like well you have to do lecture it doesn't have to be lecture you can have you can walk in a classroom and just do groups and i've done that for like most, most of my career and a lot of people are like oh my gosh the heresy how can you not have lecture you have to stand up there and blurt out information and then do a test yeah we've learned that that's not necessarily the best way to do it so i think it takes time you have to, my, like I said, my daughter did high school very mm-hmm. successfully. I had great relationships to her instructors. I talked to her teachers like once a week and never did she have live sessions. So I think a lot of this is people have to wrap their mind around online learning is different from yeah. face-to-face. And even face-to-face has evolved over time. So we have to really uh, be... A bit of a balance and an adjustment. And um, what, what, what tips would you give for... Uh, I'm hoping there are no dinosaurs left and we're all pretty much uh, up to speed with with Zoom and Teams and Google Classroom. But uh, uh, any insights or uh, what what would be your top tips for people still reluctant? Because I'm sure there's one or two that still haven't quite adjusted. 
I think you have to just wrap your mind around the idea of just trying different stuff. Be creative. Just the same way we do in a face-to-face -face classroom. There was some, a time when people observed my class, they were like, you know what, instead of just lecturing and just like standing there, why don't you just get them, like say something and give them like a little, like a little overview and then let them teach the lesson. I'm like, no, I can't do that. I have to be in control. So we have to get safe with the idea that you can be vulnerable. I think my biggest thing that I've used over the past 10 years when it comes to online is discussion board. Discussion mm -hmm. board is just like how in LinkedIn we've connected and we've talked and in a normal setting, I might not come up to you and be like, hey, Ross, what's up? Uh, you know, let's talk about online learning and let's have a discussion. But we feel totally comfortable with messaging each other on LinkedIn and being like, hey, let's talk. Let's, sure. let's kind of vibe about this whole online thing. So it's the same thing. I've had the most great relationships with students in an online environment because mm -hmm. you put a question out there, post it, just like on LinkedIn, you post a question yeah. and then let everybody jump in and, and talk about it. And sometimes people don't do that in real life. In the classroom, students are hesitant. Mm -hmm. These are digital natives, a lot of these young students, they're digital natives, like we talked about our kids. My son lives on his tablet. So they're used to interacting in online. They do Minecraft, they do Roblox, they're used oh. to that. So. Um, do that. You're, you're a big fan of new technology, aren't you? So could, could you give our, our listeners a kind of synopsis of your passions, your kind of day to day work in that particular field? Yeah, I mean, I've always a, an adopter. I think that there's so many different things that you can use that the technology is always changing. So there's all these different um, when it comes to platforms, you can use a platform and you can integrate almost anything like I, I'm, I'm pretty much like anything that's out there. I just try it. So whether it's integrating different types of discussion boards, whether it's integrating different types of video. I don't think it's necessary that video is bad, but I just think that people tend to get inundated sometimes. It's just like, I wouldn't want to look at an hour long YouTube video, but I'll look at a five minute YouTube video. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to just be aware that all these different technologies, try them and see what works and see what students respond to. I think sometimes we are like, well, this is what works and this is what worked for me. So this is what it's going to be. And students are different and students are adaptable. So there's, all these different technologies that are out there. There's all these different discussion board technologies. There's all these different interactive technologies. But honestly, just from being in the classroom, students are not as into the technology as they as into relationship building. It's just like me and you, right? Like if we can use whatever technology that we want, but at the end of the yeah. day, if we don't have a vibe I, and I don't develop a connection I with you. That word relationships, every conversation I have at the moment. And I think, you know, regardless of doing it online, um, you know, we, we are, we do work in a relationships based education. Uh, just kind of putting you in the corner for technology. What are your kind of go to tools that you are regularly using today on your phone or on your desktop that's the thing I, I, and uh, people do that all the time i, I literally have people that are pin me down they're like what do you use <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> I, it, it really depends on the platform because i'm literally like bare bones when it comes to i love technology but when it comes to teaching students i don't think there's any one technology because oh. when it comes to platforms for us a lot of times we'll use like a blackboard or we'll use whatever the lms is the platform that we use and a lot of times it'll have integrated into it like a collaborate where you use video like this and it has a chat. I'm like, when it comes to students and interacting, I don't really think it's necessary about the, the technology itself. Mm -hmm. It's about how you utilize. And you could, I, I tell my students sometimes, don't even contact me on the platform. Yeah. Send me an email or text me. Like my students love, they could text me at like midnight and I'll respond. Cause I'm like, I'm awake. Why wouldn't I respond? Right. And that might not be the same in the K through 12, because obviously it's young kids or whatever the case may be. But the fact of the matter it still is it's all about relationship building. So if you have parents that you're dealing with or students that you are dealing with and you're saying, I have an open door policy and I have the ability to be able to connect with you. When my daughter took classes online, I appreciate it, but this, the, the, the instructors would text me and say, this is where your daughter is at and this is what she's missing. I didn't care about the technology. And I think sometimes as educators, we're like, oh, what's the next technology? Yeah, what can well, I use? <laughs> The academic in me, you know, I, I, you know, my, my question was poorly framed, I suppose, you know, context is, you know, what age, what subject, what activity, how long for, um, you know, so I, I, I guess context is key, what works, works in a particular environment. And if I just shift towards diversity, Elizabeth, um, I, I just want to talk about the George Floyd incident that happened, you know, which has rocked and shaped many of us around the world. Can I just... Uh, ask you for your thoughts on uh, the mood over in the, the States. 
It's been really different, you know, that uh, race is a huge issue here in America and the context here is a little bit different than it would be probably elsewhere in the world, but it's an issue all over, I think all over the globe. Here, a lot of people just feel as though we have to kind of rip the covers off of it. And it's always something that's kind of like a subtext of race is an issue, but it's very taboo to really talk about it and, and really put a spotlight on it. And I think for education too, we know that there are a, a lot of disparities when it comes to race. And mm -hmm. if we don't talk about those disparities, then we're not gonna be able to improve and make it a better environment for our students. Mm -hmm. We have to have more teachers that are um, able to relate to the students in the classroom. So mm -hmm. the only way to do that is to focus on how do we increase the uh, representation of marginalized students? How do we increase the faculty that look like the students in the classroom? Students are getting more and more diverse here in the States. We have, mm -hmm. you know, that we went through 2008 with a huge economic decline. So we have less and less students that are um, from the dominant culture and more of our students are going to be students that are from more diverse backgrounds. So how do we handle that in the classroom? And how do we make sure that the faculty and administration and those that the students see are representative of them so that we can be more effective for well, them. My mind's been ticking over as you've been talking away, you know, although it's my own memory, um, I have very few recollections of discussing race in my, in my, probably my entire education until maybe university. Uh, and then obviously as a teacher, it helped my own understanding. And then throughout the last 30 years in the classroom, being really good to see uh, you know, I, I talk here from a British perspective, I suppose, uh, you know, it being a bit more of a prevalent and important discussion uh, in assemblies, lessons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where, where is that, you know, in your context, in your college, you know, how, how often is it, is it just left to maybe anecdotal conversations or is there a, a specific part of your curriculum where it's consciously discussed in, a, in an environment where students learn how to have very healthy discussions on race. It's not discussed and that's really a part of the problem and that's right. why people are so frustrated and people have taken to the streets because of the fact that race is something that it's kind of taken as well it's just like okay I'm a woman I'm black and there's nothing to talk about and we all know those of us that live in this culture that that's simply not true. And I've seen that in K through 12, as well as in higher ed, that it's definitely something that's not talked about. It's not really a part of the curriculum. When I went to university, when I went to University of Florida, I think I had like one African-American studies class and it wasn't required. So it's definitely not something that is a part of the standing curriculum. And like you said, it's something that a lot of times you don't discuss necessarily until you go to college and then it says your choice, if it's something that you wanna take a class on that, but it will be an elective. So that's a part of what the discussions have been. How do we teach students in K through 12? How are we more responsive and making sure that we address history and accurately address history? We're coming up on Thanksgiving. What do yeah. we talk about when we talk about indigenous people and their history of this in this country? And typically I worked on the Seminole reservation for a few years and that's, I lived right 20 minutes away from the reservation and didn't know anything about that culture sure. because that just wasn't taught that. So there's um, um, definitely a lot of work to be done. I apologize, this is probably a big question, but um, what would be your recommendation? And I know, in America, you're subdivided into states and then there's sub-states within states, et cetera. But if we could make a start to get racism just put into the curriculum and at least then maybe inform pedagogy, are there any things that you're aware of that's already happening or would you have some recommendations for policymakers? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of talk and I think a lot of it is grassroots. A lot of it is coming from the students that are demanding now that districts be more um, responsive. There definitely isn't like a state level curriculum. Each each uh, or a national curriculum. Each state is responsible, and then like you said, each county or each dis school district is responsible for um, kind of making sure that the curriculum is um, disseminated to the students. So I think it's going to really take students and parents being more vocal. If the if the the mm -hmm. states realize that this is something that is necessary, and the students are speaking out, and that's what I've seen a lot of groundswell in these grassroots efforts where students are saying, hey, you have to teach us this stuff. We don't know any of this stuff. And, and we wanna make sure that we're aware of what's happening and, and how to be more responsive to it as students and as future leaders, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm sure you discuss uh, racism and many other things on your podcast. Could you tell listeners about your Ed Up Experience podcast? 
Yeah, the Edup Experience is a podcast that was started in like January by my co-host. Uh, Elvin is now the producer, and I've stepped into a co-host role with Dr. Joe Salucio. So it's myself and Joe, and we basically have interviewed over the past 10 months about 100, wow. um, 114 or so, I think we're at right now, uh, ed tech leaders, uh, college presidents, those are the movers and shakers, innov innovators in business that are on the pulse, have their fingers on the pulse of education, um, the workplace and how we can be more responsive as a sector. So we have talked about race. We definitely, especially since George Floyd, asking schools how they're being responsive. A lot of those same questions that you ask me, well, how do you deal with diversity? What are some of your plans? How have you responded to the Black Lives Matter movement? And how can we as a sector be more responsive? So it's definitely something that we're asking leaders mm -hmm. because without these conversations, then we're not going to see change. So we want to just have these conversations, make sure that these conversations are normalized because it has been something that has been a little bit Mm -hmm. undercover like we can't talk about that we don't want to keep you know talking about things and and bringing up things that make people uncomfortable the conversations if they're going to be uncomfortable have to be had in order to make change mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm reminded of a podcast i did with uh dr tina owen moore and i, I believe it's the the alliance way in milwaukee I, I, I understand it was the first bully free school in america and she said um when people take time to understand one another there is less opportunity to do harm and we, we mentioned about relationships and you know us connecting on LinkedIn and yourself and your podcast making that online connection that's led to a podcast. Um, so you know, thinking about online world and you know kids growing up with technology, we, we mentioned earlier. Um, what what would, what's your thoughts on uh, you know the social media epoch? You know, it's everywhere and ev you know everywhere you go, it's online. It's quicker. It's faster. You can see virality videos all sorts of things um what are your thoughts on this social media revolution that we're living in i love social media i'm like a, a true digital native i had a myspace page i've always been like an early adopter when it comes to technology that's why I, I i'm not really set on one type of technology because i think technology changes so much that we just have to use whatever grab whatever you have and yeah. bring your own personality to it right so i love the idea of utilizing technology and i think that as a adopter of technology that's why i don't invest myself in technology like facebook was like the popping thing for like a couple of years a few years and now it's like people are like oh facebook only my grandmother's only my mom is on facebook so i don't really get invested in technology it was my facebook too if i'm honest <laughs> right exactly right so i don't really get invested in technology because i think at the core of the technology is going to be the relationship building skill like we want to be making oh. sure that whatever the, even if i'm texting you i'm going to be able to develop a relationship with you so i don't want to get reliant on it, it has to be this type of tool app that i'm using now these digital natives they're not even using like facebook they're using uh TikTok, they're using whatever is new that's what they jump on and if we get invested i think for us older people we tend to say well this is the this is the technology you have to have and then if you don't have that then what are you going to do because they're not using facebook a lot of them are getting away from instagram you created a TikTok account elizabeth Oh, you already know. Of course I did. I'm not, I'm not seeing it. I'm not checking that. So I'll take it. <laughs> you gotta check. You gotta check it out. I'm dancing on there and everything. Because you know what? Anything that's new, I will use it. And then when it gets oh, like I have Snapchat. But when it's not popping anymore, I just stop using it. So I think we yeah. have to get in that mindset just no, like I what mean, the kids I, I, do. I've tried the um I've tried the Snapchat. I gave up. Uh, I've done about <laughs> seven videos on TikTok. And uh, my fear is I've spread myself too thin and it becomes a bit of a workload issue. Do, uh, do you feel the same? because you know what i i still have to rely on like i always have my tried and true so a lot of those are just more like icing on the cake like if i want to connect with my students a lot of times it's like okay we have the platform and we can have discussion in there if you really need to contact me you can text me and all that other stuff is just like fun so it's almost like i don't really look at it like i'm spreading myself too thin it's almost like linkedin or ig or any other technology i'm just using them and it's just like a it's like a vehicle it's not necessarily yeah. something that i'm gonna use to the point where it gets overwhelming now, you know liz we've passed my 20 minute barrier quite <laughs> quite, quite some margin when we get lost in our discussions or my fault really and so i'm now going to throw loads of quick fire questions at you and my, sure. my hope is that i can uh catch you off guard but um we'll see how we go so um you, no pausing and hesitating um, okay. so uh, we'll start off easy if, if i visited fort lauderdale for 24 hours where would you take me 
I would take you to Las Olas. Las Olas is like the downtown Fort Lauderdale. So it's like the place that you go. It's like on the water. There's like bars down there. Yeah. Ooh, can I say that? You might have an adult <laughs> beverage or two. Walk <laughs> around and it's really laid back. It's not like South Beach, which is super hyper and it's like so much going on. It's a little bit like South Beach 2.0. So uh -huh. that's where I would take you. Okay, thank you. Um, if I deleted all your apps on your phone, which one would you like to keep on it? I would have to see Instagram. I don't Instagram. care about anything else. Like you could say <laughs> Facebook, you could say, I probably would say, I should say LinkedIn, but like I use That's Instagram. <laughs> I use Instagram like literally every day of my life. Like I cannot almost live without Instagram. So I would have to say Instagram and then maybe LinkedIn would be okay. like my second. Um, fond memories of the Salvation Army, uh, myself included. Um, what would be, um, you know, you know, in terms of your experience with the Salvation Army, your recommendations for people that aren't aware of it in terms of the work that they do? I love Salvation Army. It was like one of my first jobs out of college and I love their Angel Tree program. I love the fact that they really focus on at the holidays, how to make sure that children are not without. And also they do a lot with addiction and making sure that people have a safe place to go if they are recovering from addiction because that's been stigmatized a lot in society. Mm -hmm. So they definitely do so much good work with the homeless and so much good work with trying to make sure that they create spaces that are safe. And sometimes people don't really have insurance or don't really have the ability to go out there and get some of those services. So they provide really a safe haven. I love their mission and everything that they do. I'm like a real big fan, actually. I was right. so happy to see that you yes. are affiliated or knew about them. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you um, a Zoom sure. team or a Google? User. I would have to say Team Zoom just because everybody is using it. Like I use Google, but not as much. Uh -huh. I use Google for other stuff like Drive and for you know email and for YouTube. But I definitely would have to say Zoom would be my go-to for video. Sure. Uh, what book are you reading? Right now, geez, what am I reading? I think the last thing I was reading was um, The Souls of Black Folk. I'm reading that again by W.E.B. Du Bois. A lot of people have been talking about race and I'm starting to get into Ibram Kendi, how to be an anti-racist, but I feel as though W.E.B. Du Bois is a foundation of everything when it comes to anti-racism, like the whole idea of double consciousness, the whole idea of how black people feel in America and how they are perceived in America. So I'm actually rereading yeah. The Souls All of Black right, Folk right now. One, out. one of my favorite books is, um, forgetting her name now it'll come back to me uh, why i'm no longer talking to white people about race totally uh blew my mind oh. really really powerful but i'll send you the link um, yes please do what, what's on your desk today what's your current project well um right now on my project it, on my desk is i'm just looking at different um projects for the podcast so different ways that we can kind of expand our reach. My biggest project that I'm working on for our podcast is um, working on the YouTube channel. So looking at ways that I can um, increase our diversity as far as talking to Black leaders in the community and how to be more responsive with just not educating about higher education, but about topics surrounding race, anti-racism, social justice, and things of that nature as well. Right. Well, I've got plenty of voices I can signpost you to here in the UK if you need them to Absolutely. Black voices. Um, now, I'm going to assume you're doing the best job in the world already, but what would be your off-the-wall career that you uh, dreamed of but never did? Oh my gosh, what's an off the wall? I, I don't know. I don't think anything is off the wall, but if there was something that I probably uh, would have wanted to do. Crazy or a deep sea diver. Yeah. Yeah, I, I probably would want to be like an actress or something like I would want to like actually go and just like be a movie star and oh, just like, <laughs> act. like I honestly feel like at the other day I said that I was like you know what if I really would have done it again I probably would have went to school for drama or something because I'm just like a drama queen anyway I love to like ham it up right. for the camera so probably <laughs> um, actress. When, when lockdown ends and um, where where do you want to be uh, your next vacation? My next vacation, I probably want to go to the Caribbean. I'm like really aching to take my husband and go to Jamaica and let him see like my family's like um, origin and where we are from. So yeah, probably Jamaica. Great. Um, biggest uh, career achievement to date? Most Top voices, just like you. Top voices, <laughs> <laughs> um, Who do you recommend I interview next and why? Oh, wow. Who can you interview? I mean, any, I think anybody on Top Voices would be good. Doug Lederman. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get through the, the top 10 list. I've, yeah. I've, I've been Nikki earlier today, so it's yourself. 
now. Yeah, really absolutely. Doug, Doug Lederman was really interesting. We had him on the podcast early, like in like March or so. Uh, the founder of Inside Higher Education, he left from Chronicle Education and went and founded Inside Higher Education. So he would be a good pick, I think. Right. Uh, well, I work my way through it. Um, yeah, for sure. Where can listeners find out more about you, your your links, your podcasts? Where can they go? Yeah, we they can go to edupexperience.com. That's where they can find my podcast. I also have a YouTube channel where I am the host of that particular venue where we talk that platform and we talk about race and mm -hmm. issues surrounding the black community so they can um hit me up on either one of those we have an instagram obviously they can also just look for me search for my name on instagram LinkedIn. as well <laughs> that's right yeah definitely and, and I, I love social media i love connecting i love meeting new people i'm glad i got a chance to meet you this is all about relationships and connecting like you said it's like the, the key word the buzzword right now so it yeah I mean, uh, my final question uh liz is um what would you hope to be your legacy? If I can have a legacy, I think that it has become the idea, has always been educating and making sure that I provide uh, a better way forward for my students, but also in terms of race in America, helping to raise my voice to help people to understand how we need to come together to make this country a better place. And a lot of that has to do with inequity and how we can adjust and make changes and grow and evolve from where we are and be better. That's really the bottom line. How can we be better? How can we move forward? How can we make sure America as a country is fair for everybody? And that would, I would yeah. want that to be my legacy. That would be a great thing to achieve. Um, Elizabeth Leiber, thank you very much. It's been great to connect and, and start our relationship um, through LinkedIn voices and connecting with you. Uh, we work quite quick, I think, to be fair. Um, you know, only a, a week or so ago we connected. So I hope it's the beginning of something um, we can connect and share content regularly. Um, I hope so. Elizabeth, thank you very much for your time. Keep up the good work. I can't wait to, uh, to chat on your podcast and listen to more of the content over there. And Absolutely. And I get to come and visit you in Fort Lauderdale. At one come point. on down. You can, you can come. The open invitation is there for you. Brilliant. All right, well, let's go to that bar. <laughs> yeah, for sure, right? Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Take care.